and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Nicholas Bowie, Assistant Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. We will discuss his article, Why the Constitution Was Written Down, which was published in the Stanford Law Review. So welcome to the show, Nico. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I read your paper when you initially posted it, and I just reread it, and I got to say, it is just phenomenally good, and I love it so much, and it really changed the way I thought about the early history of of the Constitution. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> but for readers who haven't had a chance to read it yet, um, I wonder if you could just start by talking a little bit about sort of why it's important that the United States Constitution was written down kind of conceptually and sort of what the conventional explanations of that are, just as kind of a framing device to kind of help people understand why your rethinking is so provocative and important. Sure. So I approach this issue looking at the history of the relationship between corporations and government. That's what led to the research in the first place and was sort of fascinated to learn that more than half of the 13 colonies that rebelled in 1776 were founded by or as corporations. So that was just an interesting fact that I felt I was never taught, you know, in high school or in college or as a, as a history major. And then uh, getting a doctorate in history. It was just, it's, it's something that I think should be more widely known, that this is a country in which the states were largely founded by corporations. And so this paper was one of the implications of that history. The fact that so many states were founded by corporations, it's not surprising that a lot of the institutions of states have their origins in corporations and in corporate law. So Massachusetts was founded as the Massachusetts Bay Company. Its charter forms the basis for a lot of this story, which is basically a story of how this corporate charter evolved into a constitution. And the end result is we have this important document, uh, the, the U.S. Constitution or the state constitutions that describe what governments can do that limit their powers, that um, allow anybody on the street to read, you know, what it is that uh, their states are authorized to perform or what they're allowed to do in a way that's just fundamentally different from Great Britain, which is the, the country that, you know, the United States seceded from. And so the fact that the United Kingdom does not have this coherent code of law that is its constitution, whereas the United States does, is sort of the puzzle that uh, the paper attempts to, to provide an answer to. Right, right. Well, so for listeners who might not be that familiar with 16th and 17th century corporations law, maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit about what a corporate charter looked like at the time that the colonies were founded? In other, words, in other words, sort of how did they work? What did they do? How did people conceptualize what a corporation was at that point in time? Sure. So it, it's not terribly different from today. So even though this is a story about the 17th and 18th century, it's a story that I think would happen in the future. Like basically Massachusetts is as if SpaceX went to the moon um, and founded a, a moon colony there. And then 200 years later, you know, SpaceX had a very you know, well-established government on the moon and no one had looked to see, you know, where did this come from? Like what was SpaceX when it was in the United States as a private corporation? And Massachusetts is roughly similar that when it was founded as a 17th century corporation, it, you know, it had directors, it had shareholders. Uh, the corporate charter is very similar to a corporate charter today in that it, you know, basically explained uh, what the corporation was entitled to do. It said who chartered the company. Um, and so corporations were, as particularly the English colonial corporations, were generally understood the same way that 
modern corporations are. You, you incorporate in order to get people together to perform this common purpose. I think the big difference between a 17th century corporation like Massachusetts and SpaceX or Amazon today is today corporate charters are no longer the main method by which states regulate corporations. But in the 17th century, corporate charters were the method of regulation. So by putting in words what the Massachusetts Bay Company was allowed to do, that was the way in which the Crown or other regulators could say, well, we're looking and seeing what you are in fact doing, and it's not what the charter authorizes. So we're going to take action. Mm, mm. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I found really striking about your paper is that sort of, I think my impression was always that this kind of shift to wanting to write down constitutional principles was something that happened in a really kind of um, you know, like all of a sudden sort of way. And you show how this was uh, kind of a conceptualization that developed over a much longer longer period of time, beginning quite early in the history of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. I wonder if you could kind of walk listeners through the story of how the Massachusetts Bay Company Colony was was founded and sort of highlight for them some of those kind of critical moments in reconceptualizing the nature of the corporate charter in relation to, to governance. Sure. So the Massachusetts Bay Company was chartered like pretty much any other company that existed at the time. Uh, so in, in 1628, 1629. And so there were a few other colonial corporations at the time, like the Virginia Company. Um, other corporations included cities. So the city of London, the city of Bristol, uh, universities like the University of Cambridge or Oxford. Churches were considered corporations. Um, there were very few business corporations. And so the thing that all of these corporations had in common was generally sort of public-minded or public-oriented. Um, you, you, the Crown chartered a corporation in order to delegate some of its authority to other people to exercise by themselves. And what made the Massachusetts Bay Company unique among pretty much all other English corporations at the time is the people who founded the Massachusetts Bay Company saw a corporation not only as an institution they could use to facilitate uh, transatlantic colonization, but also they saw that a corporation is a form of government that they could transfer to the North American colony that they were planning to establish. So, a lot of the organizers of the Massachusetts Bay Company were Puritans, so they were in the religious minority in uh, 17th century England, but before the English Civil War. And they saw Massachusetts in North America as an opportunity for them to sort of establish a model government for England to follow. Um, and so that, that's the whole city on the hill metaphor of its found of the well, one of the first chief executives of the company, John Winthrop saying that by going over, taking our corporation and our corporate governance overseas, we can sort of set up a state in Massachusetts that um, people in England can look at and copy. And when they brought the corporation and the corporate charter over to Boston, it was the first time in English history that any corporation had set up shop outside of England. So it basically considered itself no longer a corporation bound necessarily by English law in that, you know, parliament legislates for the island of Great Britain, but not necessarily for North America. They saw the corporation become the government for the Massachusetts colony. And this was different from every other corporation. So Virginia, when it established its colony overseas, the corporation stayed in London. It had board meetings in London. Uh, it you know, sent letters back and forth across the Atlantic to manage its overseas colony. But in Massachusetts, the entire corporate government moved overseas. And so the CEO, the board of directors, all of the voting shareholders all moved to Massachusetts at once in 1629 and 1630. And so that made it just a very different type of corporation than all the other corporations that existed. Very similar to cities, but cities outside of sort of English jurisdiction. And 
there was, you know, uh, a few fights between other landowners. Uh, so Ma Massachusetts became like a very aggressive colony. Um, it, it acquired land. It fought with native tribes. Um, it, you know, exercised a lot of um, sort of violence-based force to, to extend its jurisdiction. And it made a lot of enemies. And so those enemies, particularly the well-connected enemies in England, were sort of led by these two men, Ferdinando Gorges and uh, John Mason, who tried to get the crown to sort of repeal the charter that it had given to the Massachusetts Bay Company. And the basis by which a company could be dissolved was the uh, uh, crown needed evidence that the company was violating its charter. So when people in Massachusetts found out that uh, there were proceedings against it in England threatening its charter, uh, ordinary people within the colony took steps to make sure that the government abided by the terms of the charter in a way that was not necessarily uh, a true in, among English corporations. So one example um, was the, the charter authorized uh, shareholders to vote on corporate bylaws. And when the company initially went overseas, the CEO, John Winthrop, was really hesitant to allow shareholders to vote. He thought, well, you know, I know more about everything that's happening right now than you do. So just the board of directors is going to make the decisions for the colony. But once the charter was seen by residents of Massachusetts towns, they got really angry and thought, look, this charter says that we can participate. If you don't abide by this term, we risk losing our government. And so we demand essentially that you allow us to vote on future legislation. And they voted him out of office. They, you know, they basically put themselves into the corporate governing structure. Eventually it morphed into this bicameral system where the shareholders had one house and the board of directors had another house. Um, and they both had to collaborate in order to pass legislation because of how they interpreted the charter. But over time, the terms of the charter became the term by which in, like, political discussions in Massachusetts uh, were established. And it was out of the sphere that if they didn't, then the, com the, the company's opponents in England would use that as an excuse to dissolve the corporation. It's so interesting because it's like there's a sort of weird shift from like shareholder sovereignty to popular sovereignty in a, in a sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... Another unique aspect of the company was rather, so, so most companies at the time, like most companies today, had a sort of um, voting was tied to ownership. You had to own a share of the company in order to participate. But as a way of inducing people, particularly Puritans, to go overseas, the company sort of liberalized its membership. So you could become a shareholder not by purchasing property in the company, but by becoming a member of one of the local churches. And so churches became the mechanism by which people became shareholders and it expanded the franchise beyond people who could afford to vote, but it also limited the franchise to people who shared uh, the same religious values. And so I think colonial Massachusetts by contemporary standards is more often thought of as a theocracy because of, you know, the Salem witch trials in the late 17th century, but also in Hutchinson and uh, a lot of fights among Puritans with uh, Quakers and other religious minorities in North New England. But even though religion had a huge effect on the development of Massachusetts, there was a very strong separation between church and state in every respect other than to become a member of the company, you had to be a member of a church. Mm -hmm. Well, and one thing that really struck me about the story that you told was the way in which... <clears throat> In some respect, the charter almost seemed to become like ideologically important for the Massachusetts colonists, at least in part because of the efforts to repeal or amend it. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about kind of how that happened and why the efforts by Gorgeous and Mason and by the Crown or by Parliament to sort of shift the governance of the colony were so important to the way that people thought about the nature and meaning of, of the charter. So I think 
so there, there's a legal answer, there's a religious answer, there's a social answer, there, there's a bunch of different answers. Um, legally, which is the, the, the main thrust of the story is legally the company was in jeopardy if there was evidence that it was violating the terms of the charter. And so over time that led everybody in Massachusetts who cared about the continuation of the government to make arguments for laws and company policy on the basis of its charter. In contrast, British corporations like the city of London uh, tended not to care so much about um, what the terms of the charter allowed, in part because when the company violated some, when the company took a controversial action in England, the remedy was to argue that it violated the law of parliament, that it violated a statute. Um, and so there were lots of cases in the 17th century and 18th century of people complaining that a corporation was violating a statute. In Massachusetts, which was so far removed from, uh, from parliament's exercises of jurisdiction and in which it was impossible to get you know, a royal or a parliamentary official to listen to or enforce parliament's uh, decisions or parliament statute, the charter became the mechanism by which people argued for and against law. So there were you know, disputes about, should we allow immigration? Um, and those disputes took you know, these very textualist interpretations of the, stat, of the charter to argue, we have to allow anyone who wants to live here to immigrate here, uh, which some people argued, whereas others looked at the charter and thought, no, based on this charter, we are in charge of our membership. We can exclude immigrants if we want to. And that was true of religious arguments, of immigration arguments, of arguments over the company's jurisdiction. Everything looked at what does the charter allow us to do? And so that just created this legal culture uh, in which the charter's terms became, like when the company passed laws, it looked to the charter to figure out uh, where in the charter does it allow us to pass this law or to take this action, even if the laws were incredibly controversial, like laws that executed Quakers or laws that annexed Maine or laws that banned Christmas. I mean, this is not a popular company, but all of the first war on Christmas. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, <laughs> you know, Increase Mather, one of the company's um, uh, advocates, was incredibly anti-Christmas because he thought uh, first, you know, the uh, by just celebrating it in December, the date was wrong because the Bible suggests that Jesus was born when shepherds were tending to their flock. So it had to be in the spring, not in December. And he thought it had the word mass in it. So that made it too Catholic. Um, whereas, you know, a good Puritan was, uh, um, you know, someone who didn't uh, participate in any sort of Catholic uh, celebrations. And you know, the, the charter had text in it that said the company can make laws that, you know, for the general welfare of the people of the, of the company. And by looking at that section of the charter, they said, look, we have this general power to ban things that we think violate the Bible or that violate our own precepts of you know, what, what this colony should look like. And we're going to you know, interpret this charter to the fullest. And so religiously, I think, you know, because, um, most of the members of the company, all the members of the company were, were members of the churches and Puritans in particular just really cared about biblical text. Uh, you know, it was easy for them to look at the text of the charter and say, yes, this is consistent with what we do with the Bible and what we do with our law. With the Bible, we look at the text of the document and decide whether Christmas is, uh, you know, should be celebrated or should not be celebrated. And we look to the text of the charter to see if we have the power to ban Christmas. Like both of those things are consistent with just like a very text-based orientation. Um, and as they saw themselves under threat from England, you know, that just like built up into a snowball where uh, the, the charter took on terms like, uh, they, they called it a constitution in the 17th century. They called it uh, their Magna Carta. They called it their covenant with God. Uh, they, they really cared about what the charter allowed them to do because they saw the protection for their own self-government and their own religious interests. Right, right. Well, I think a lot of listeners 
might be more familiar with kind of U.S. constitutionalism and in particular contemporary U.S. thinking about the nature of a constitution. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how this sort of charter-based constitutional thinking was different from constitutional thinking in England at the time. So con the, the, the term constitution was in the 17th century, a term that was sort of developing its contemporary meaning. So it, it was originally used metaphorically to refer to like, it to refer to a body. So in the same way that you can have, you know, a friendly constitution or an unfriendly constitution, if, you know, based on your own uh, internal humors, uh, the body politic was understood to have a constitution. And so in debates in England over uh, whether the crown was authorized to levy taxes without parliament's consent or whether parliament was authorized to, um, you know, prohibit the crown from taking certain actions that it thought uh, were inconsistent with past precedent. Those debates uh, on the language of constitutionalism to argue that the constitution of the English body politic does not allow the crown or parliament to dominate the other institution. Um, and in parliaments, so parliament basically wins this battle uh, over time. And, and you can see it today with the, the preeminence of the House of Commons and the contemporary United Kingdom compared to the crown. Um, but in doing so, it built on a series of precedents that it regarded as particularly important for the British constitution. So Magna Carta, uh, you know, this, this charter signed in 1215 um, was seen as an important precedent because of what it said about the nature of the English constitution, that the crown could not tax uh, the subjects of England without their consent. Um, you know, eventually other sort of examples of crown confession, like the Petition of Right, uh, or eventually the Bill of Rights in 1689, were seen as equally important for establishing principles of the British Constitution. But the, the key takeaway is that Constitution in this context has never referred to this single document or even a single list of, you know, what is part of the British Constitution that limits what the Crown and Parliament can do. And so today, you know, it, when the United Kingdom is attempting to navigate Brexit, it's not a question of, you know, can Parliament, um, you know, uh, take England or take the United Kingdom out of the European Union unilaterally because it violates uh, a particular statute or Magna Carta or any other really important document. It's a question of can Parliament act consistent with sort of fundamental principles that all of these documents uh, are illustrations of. So that's the British constitution. And I call it throughout the paper an unwritten constitution. And obviously it has written components to it, but by, by the unwritten constitution, what the United Kingdom Supreme Court and what I am talking about is this idea that it refers to a series of unwritten principles that are codified in sort of like different documents of the time. Whereas in Massachusetts, they had this charter. Uh, it was a single document. It said everything that the company was allowed to do. And it referenced unwritten ideas. So the Massachusetts Bay Company's charter said, for example, that it couldn't take any actions that violated uh, or that were repugnant to uh, the laws of England or that um, the, the charter also contained language that said the liberties and immunities of the subject of England would have the same liberties and immunities overseas as they would in England. Uh, you know, so they were referencing other sort of unwritten principles or other documents. But the point that was really important for people in Massachusetts was everything is in one place. You can just look at the charter and you have a list of what should I be consulting? What am I allowed to do? What is the basic structure? What can this government not do? And it was a way of mobilizing support for government policies or mobilizing opposition when people thought the policies were unwarranted. Um, and that, that basically was the, the debate uh, that precipitated the American Revolution 
in the 1760s and 1770s, which, you know, a large part of which took place in Massachusetts as a dispute over whether um, the actions of the royally appointed governor or whether the actions of parliament violated the terms of the Massachusetts Bay Company or Massachusetts's charter um, with people like John Adams and um, his contemporaries arguing that the charter codified certain principles and codified certain language that parliament and the crown could not violate. Mm -hmm. So in your story, you, you really explain and illustrate how this shift in constitutional thinking took place over quite a long period of time. And, and I couldn't help but wondering, like, to what extent did people in England understand what was happening? Understand the, the distinction or what do you mean? Under, understand how American or Massachusetts specific ways of conceptualizing constitution were shifting from this kind of unwritten conception of the, con the kind of constitutional conception of a constitution to a kind of document centric concept of a constitution. I mean, did, did you get the impression that they saw that taking place or was it something that they maybe didn't realize was happening until too late. Um, so, you so the, the the paper starts in 1620 and ends in 1790, basically. So it, it it is a long period, and over that period, English and British administrators, I think, certainly saw that in Massachusetts, in particular, people seemed to really care about their corporate charter. Um, there was one particular administrator who I focus on, Edward Randolph, who um, was the brother-in-law of um, one of the families that Massachusetts took land from. And he became the sort of colonial administrator who went back and forth trying to provide evidence that Massachusetts was violating its charter so that the Crown could dissolve the company. And he, in all of his dispatches back to England, was just in awe by how much people seemed to revere this document um, and how important it was to them that every decision be made with reference to the document and how they had this, you know, they, they treated it as scripture, essentially. Um, so I think early on, there was recognition among the British bureaucracy that in Massachusetts, uh, the charter was taking on more importance than it did um, or than a similar charter might have uh, had in England. But even as, you know, the, so that, that was in the 1670s, 1680s. So even 100 years later, um, as uh, Massachusetts, you know, walked the road toward independence, a lot of the dispute between crown officials and sort of revolutionaries like James Adams, uh, John Adams or Samuel Adams um, took place on the terms that Massachusetts had originally set out in the 17th century. So there was a governor, Thomas Hutchinson, um, or Lieutenant Governor who became the governor, who in 1774, 1775, um, was like the face of parliamentary taxation. So he was the main advocate for the idea that um, Parliament had the right to tax the colonies, even though the colonies had no representation in Parliament. And a lot of his arguments were based on the text and the interpretation of Massachusetts's charter. Uh, so he looked, he, he was also a historian. So he had all of these primary sources from the 17th century. And so he knew the whole story about how this company had turned into uh, the, the colony with, uh, that revered his charter. And so, you know, for example, in a dispute over whether uh, he had the power to locate the uh, General Assembly in Boston, where people were throwing tea into the harbor and otherwise... Uh, harming uh, tax commissioners to Cambridge or to Salem or to some other city that seemed safer. He, he made his argument based on the text of what the charter allowed. And when it came to parliamentary taxation, similarly pointed to the clause that said that the company or the, the company's provincial successor uh, couldn't take any actions that violated or that were repugnant to the laws of England. And he honed in on that clause and said, look, 
your charter allows the laws of England to govern overseas. Therefore, when Parliament taxes you, your charter requires you to abide by that taxation. Whereas Adams and Otis and other uh, revolutionaries pointed to different clauses of the charter to explain why. No, in fact, what you're misreading our constitution. Our constitution allows only us to tax ourselves with our consent and has no role for Parliament to exercise jurisdiction. So I think there was a recognition uh, that even if you know the British Constitution was you know conceived very differently than what Massachusetts residents were calling their constitution, uh, there was a recognition that there was a a that that debates had to be made in line with the Charter. And I think it's not inconsequential that when Parliament took actions in response to the Boston Tea Party, the major response was to close the port of Boston and then to nullify parts of the Massachusetts Charter. The thing that you know, got people most riled up was, uh, the, was Parliament's declaration that this charter is not working. We are going to you know, take out the provision that allows you to elect you know, certain representatives, and we're going to take out the provision that allows you to call town meetings, and we're going to replace it with provisions that I think will pacify you. And you know, in the first Continental Congress, when they responded to that, they responded with a declaration that you are infringing on our rights based in our charter, as well as other natural rights, and we won't allow it. So in, in your paper, you point out, and in you, earlier in our conversation, you pointed out that the sort of historical circumstances in Massachusetts were different in some ways than some of the other colonies, just because, you know, the share, as it were, the shareholders moved to Massachusetts along with, along with the charter, uh, unlike some of the other colonies. D did you get the impression that this sort of shift or transition in constitutional thinking to a sort of charter-based way of conceptualizing the constitution was influential on other colonies as well, even though they started out in a different place? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so, so I mentioned the the continental. So one one ex explicit example of this is um, uh, after the Battle of Lexington and Concord, um, Massachusetts revolutionaries didn't know what to do because under the charter, uh, the governor had a lot of power. The governor was now sending soldiers that were shooting at them. And uh, the governor was refusing to call the legislature under the charter. Um, and so they went to the Continental Congress and said, what should we do? Like, how should we form our government uh, when we can't legally meet? And the Continental Congress responded by saying, you should go back and treat your charter as the foundation for your new government. Just pretend that the governor is not there. Um, so just excise the parts of the governor from the charter because the governor is unwilling to abide by the charter before this act of parliament that nullified part of it. And then when North, like South Carolina and New Hampshire representatives came to the Continental Congress and said, we, we also you know, want to know what should we do? How should we run our governments? The Continental Congress responded by, look, draft new charters on the basis of our example with Massachusetts and govern yourselves according to things that don't require you to abide by the dictates of this governor who is royally appointed and is directing you to do things that, um, you know, we're now fighting against. And within only a year or two, so by 1777, um, every state had adopted its own constitution on the basis of these recommendations by the Continental Congress to follow Massachusetts's example. So just, you know, looking at that alone, Massachusetts had a tremendous influence on the development of state constitutions. Um, without Massachusetts's reverence of the charter, it's unlikely that um, uh, every state immediately after or even before declaring independence would have cared so much about you know, coming up with a single document that explained what the new government had the power to do. Uh, it, it was not common in history. Uh, it was not common with rebellions that the first thing you do after rebellion is codify exactly what your government should do uh, and put limits on it. Um, but it was something that Massachusetts in particular, but you know, all the colonies pretty much by the 1770s had um, a history of doing. But just like a broader uh, general um, point to make is, you know, 
by 1700, pretty much every colony had a charter. Um, so even though not every not every colony was established originally as a corporation in the same way the Massachusetts Bay Company was, uh, charters were seen as by, by British administrators as good ways of regulating what the overseas colonies would do. So even if they didn't see the need to create an independent corporation to run their colonies, um, British administrators still created charters to outline the limits of their colonies in the same way that through the 19th century, when states created corporations, uh, charters were the method of regulation. And so if a corporation took an action that was not warranted by the charter, then it was struck down as ultra vires. Um, and so you know, even though um, you know, this, even, even though Massachusetts's story is somewhat unique to Massachusetts, every colony had a similar document that similarly described what its government was allowed to do. And that was, you know, that British administrators would hold their feet to the fire if they tried to violate it. So it's not surprising that all of these independent states would immediately sort of turn to similar charters when figuring out how to organize their new government. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I love about this story is the way it seems like the British government almost unwittingly planted the seeds for revolution in the interests of kind of maintaining good, good governance. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think, you know, one of the fun things about something like the 17th century or 18th century political history is you really get the sense that the past is another country, that the past is just totally foreign. And so to, I, that's why I think the example of like SpaceX going to the moon is sort of the, the only current day example I can think of that explains the perspective of a British bureaucrat, which is, you know, if, if SpaceX went to the moon and started a colony there and people in Congress thought this colony is not being run very well, like what would they do? You know, are you, you going to send a spaceship to the moon to like, you know, send soldiers? to make the colony comply with what Congress wants, um, you know, that, that would take a very long time. Uh, would you punish the colonial officials? Would you punish SpaceX officials who continue to live in the United States? That's only possible if they are here. If they are all on the moon, you know, you can't, you, there's only so much you can do to ensure that they abide by your wishes. And so just having a written statement of, what the company could do is, you know, continues to be a way of a, a method of regulation that I think the British saw as the only method of regulation when it came to overseas colonies, because this was this was not a, you know, especially in the 1600s, it is not as though in 1630 England there was a huge navy and army that could go wherever needed to suppress all insurrections, to enforce all laws. It, it, it just wasn't there. They didn't have the resources for it. They didn't have the people for it. And that's just a lot of work. Um, and so they were really relying on sort of informal and less expensive ways of managing its overseas empire. And the method it chose, I think, was sensible, but it also led to um, a cultural um, understanding in North America that these written documents are very important for not only the purpose of regulation, regulation from overseas, but also for internal regulation. So, so Nico, in closing, <clears throat> I got to ask, right? I mean, for better or for worse, originalism has become a really important concept in constitutional interpretation, constitutional theory, constitutional understanding. And I can't shake the feeling that your paper kind of presents a really interesting set of data for, you know, how we would think about what we mean by originalism in relation to thinking about the Constitution, to, to the extent that we think that that's kind of important today. And I wonder if you could just spend a couple minutes talking about what you think the implication of some of the observations that you make might be to the extent that people think originalism is an appropriate frame for thinking about constitutionalism today? Sure. So I think, the, I think one of the more interesting ironies of the story 
is to take an originalist perspective of the U.S. Constitution and ask, what was this sort of document? The answer that this paper provides is it's, it's a legacy of a corporate charter, that the reason why the Constitution is written down is because corporate charters were written down and corporate charters sort of evolved over time into these constitutional documents. And so I think it's useful for anyone, originalists and non-originalists, to think about, well, how did people, how did contemporaries in the 17th and 18th century interpret their corporate charters? Like what methods did they use to figure out what their charters allowed them to do or didn't allow them to do? One of those methods was originalism. So in debates between Thomas Hutchinson and John and Samuel Adams over whether parliament could tax the colonies, both Ad, the, the Adams cousins and Hutchinson looked to, you know, well, what did the charter mean in 1629? Or what did the charter's replacement in 1691 look like? Like, what did people think was the original meaning of the term repugnant to the laws of England? So, the, like, originalist arguments were made in the 1770s. But what's, what's ironic about the story is so were living constitutionalist arguments. So in interpreting terms that were capacious, like repugnant to the laws of England, or, um, you know, what, what is the assembly? Like what is referred to by that language? People often looked to extra textual sources to find the answer, or sometimes clauses of the constitution explicitly pointed to extra textual sources, like what are the liberties and immunities of a subject of England? Like the charter didn't answer that. You had to look elsewhere. Uh, and so uh, Mary Builder, the historian at Boston College, has written a great paper, I think it's in the North Carolina Law Review, about charter constitutionalism and how people in all sorts of contexts interpreted corporate charters. And what she has found in, in the 17th and 18th century, when people looked at corporate charters, it was often just a... Um, in, in the same way that the British Constitution has these documents that illustrate really important broad principles, that the text of corporate charters were sort of placeholders for much larger principles outside the four corners of the document. And those principles could change over time. So they didn't necessarily, they were not static at the moment of the creation of the corporation, but could change. The laws of England changed as the liberties and immunities of the subjects of England changed. Um, and so the net result is if we're going to interpret the U.S. Constitution as a corporate charter would have been interpreted in the uh, 1780s or 1790s, people would have interpreted corporate charters with reference to all sorts of other extra textual and changing, evolving sources. So as important as textualism and the written word is to the story, it's also important because the text and the written word pointed to unwritten principles. Awesome. Well, Nico, thanks so much for coming on the show today and congratulations on this truly fantastic paper. Thank you so much. This is really fun. George's Hill, a ragged band they called the diggers came to show the people's will. They defied the landlords, they defied the laws. They were the dispossessed, reclaiming what was theirs. We come in peace, they said, to dig and sow. We come to work the lands in common and to make the waste grounds grow. This earth divided, we will make home. So it will be a common treasury for all The sin of property we do disdain No man has any right to buy and sell the earth for private gain By theft and murder they took the land Now everywhere the walls spring up at their command They make the laws to chain us well the clergy dazzle us with heaven or they damn us into hell. We will not worship the God they serve. The God of greed who feeds the rich while poor men starve. We work, we eat together, we need no swords. We will not bow to the masters or pay rent to the lords. We are free men, though we are poor. 
Take us all, stand up for glory, stand up now. From the men of property, the orders came. They sent the hired men and troopers to wipe out the diggers' claim, tear down their cottages, destroy their corn. They were dispersed, but still the vision lingers on. You poor take courage, you rich take care. This earth was made a common treasury for everyone to share. All things in common, all people one. We come in peace, the orders came to cut them down. <laughs> 